Coming up on Virginia Currents, find out how ordinary objects become extraordinary when artist Noah Scalin gets involved. He shares with us what inspires his memorable art. Plus, gentle movement for pain relief will take you inside the class that's helping some veterans live their best lives. And cystic fibrosis is often misunderstood. Find out how far this disease has come in managing it and living with it. Also, the community fun of Contra Dance. You'll be wanting to join in for sure. And the cooking music of the microwave. All on Virginia Currents. Welcome to Virginia Currents. I'm Amy Lacey. Thinking outside the box has always been a signature trait of artist Noah Scalin. Raised in Richmond by parents who were both teachers at VCU, Noah himself became the first artist in residence at VCU School of Business. Noah's art has been featured in museums in Richmond and New York and even in Times Square, as well as in many publications. His book deal started after the Scala Day project took off. This started as a challenge Noah set for himself to create a skull out of anything every day for a year. Then the creativity spread as people across the globe began sharing their skull art. Let's hear now what keeps this creative mind ticking. There's so much negative imagery right now, and we have so much negativity in our news that I don't want to make any more negative images. So the new stuff will all be only the, the people that I think we should be looking at and talking about rather than the stuff that we should be upset by. So I lay down the matches and then I burn them so they're destroyed and then this is what's, what's left. You know, I burn this stuff and it, it makes this sort of in, indelible uh, stain on us. This isn't stuff we should just let go by. Old stuff in here. Uh, my design firm was created as what I call a socially conscious design firm. And so the idea was I was working from an ethical perspective about things I cared about. And they really appreciated that I came to their work with that mindset and feeling like if I did a good job, I'd be helping people and making some people's lives better, which would be amazing, uh, and not just selling some stuff, which uh, you know I think graphic design can turn into very frequently. Mm -hmm. And my job really was as a translator to be like, okay, let's take this you know, really important thing that you're working on, let's take this uh, goal that you have of reaching a very specific audience, let's find the right solution, and then let me use my visual skills to create the right thing to make that happen. And so that was really the great challenge of it, and that's why I enjoyed doing that work. Uh, but I did it for a long time, and so that was also why I transitioned out of it uh, now several years ago. Because I, I realized I had stopped making things for myself. I was so focused on my clients, which was what the job was about. But I sort of wasn't seeing the joy in that creation, which is really what it should be. I mean, when you're making your own things, when you're making art, doing creative work, like, there should be this passion there. And so just making that skull work every day for a year, it just ended up transforming how I saw the world, how the world saw me. It gave me all these amazing opportunities. I ended up getting book deals, I ended up traveling the world, being interviewed by all these people. It just it's this amazing set of circumstances that I could never have imagined would have come out of doing that project. What was interesting was it was exponentially more came back to me than what I put into the world. It's, it's this opportunity for me to share uh, what I learned about creativity and my passion and having other people be sparked by that. And so whoever those people are, wherever they are, uh, to, to see that, that they could be transformed as well uh, by creative work. And so my sister, who uh, was also working in the marketing world, she ended up coming to me and saying, hey, I love this thing you're now doing. I think there's a real potential there. Could we run a business together? And I said, yeah, okay, that'd be great because I can't think about this side of things. I'm focused on this. And so we uh, became partners and revamped my company from a design firm to a consultancy. My sister and I developed this thing called the Creative Sprint, which is a 30-day challenge of creativity that we offer to people as a way to sort of introduce some of these concepts that we've developed in our own practices over time and what we offer in our consulting practice. And it's just a way to say, hey, look, you just need to do a little bit of creative work every day. And if you make a practice of it, make a habit of it, uh, you'll grow creatively because it's like going to the gym, right? It's a little workout. And so it's great because then after people make it, they share it on any social media platform with our hashtag Creative Sprint. And then everybody that is doing the project sees that and supports each other. And so it's a beautiful creative environment where people are making things and supporting each other. Uh, and, and that creates this more opportunities for them to, to discover these things about how their creativity works and what they have within themselves. 
I came in and I created artwork right in their atrium, worked with the students, got donations from the, the faculty, the staff, the students, brought them in and created artwork there, taught the students in their classes, taught the faculty in, in special sessions, and created opportunities for them to see what happens when you change the culture of your organization, which is what we're trying to do with our work. I'll make this huge anamorphic portrait. Uh, I'll make it of Maggie Walker, who is this wonderful hometown hero and relates very directly to the School of Business. She's an entrepreneur. She was, you know, a, a, an amazing woman of color who grew up in the neighborhood where the school is located. Uh, so she, she's really just a, a seminal figure. And a lot of students didn't know who she was. So first of all, there's an opportunity to talk about, hey, here's your history. But using art as the way in, people were fascinated. An anamorphic piece of art basically is created so that it only looks really correct from one point in space. And so the way I tend to do it is I've got my camera set up and so through that lens is really the best way to see it. What is this weird thing on the floor? And then they walk around and sometimes they'll be like, I think there's something there, maybe it's a face, I kind of see it. And I would say, well come over to my side, look through my camera, hold up your cell phone, take a picture. And so then you have this great conversation about how your brain works, perception, uh, you know, this idea of perspective in a very literal way, but also metaphorically. Uh, so it's just this great way to engage people, and that's what art can do, right? It can just give you a different way of looking at things, and also that these are everyday materials, things they're familiar with, and that opportunity then gets you thinking about what opportunities are you missing in your life all the time? What are, what's around you? What has potential? What I was told was that, you know, there was faculty who were like concerned about what is the value of this and they, their minds were changed because of seeing this in action and seeing students getting engaged and them learning about it and them, and that seeing their space activated by having this piece of artwork in it. And then also the attention that it drew to the school in this very different way was really great. Collaboration is not a linear process where we each fit our individual piece neatly into a predetermined space. It's about bringing everyone's piece to the table and discovering the exponential ideas that only bubble up when you're not working in isolation. Creativity is really a human trait. It's something that we have within us and that has always been there. And if you look at your children or your friends' kids, you see how creative they are and they're consistently creative. But when we're so focused on perfectionism, which is a huge thing at work, when we're focused on you know, the bottom line, then we don't give people the space to do that. And, and everybody wants to be innovative right now, but what we're saying is innovation doesn't exist without creativity. And creativity is a teachable thing. It is a skill. It's not a talent. This is this moment of me shifting over as an artist and, and sort of figuring out all of this stuff. And it's a constant thing. I'm constantly figuring this out. I don't, there's, you know, to me there's no finish line. It's just, you know, endlessly trying new things and aiming yourself towards things you enjoy and trying to spend as much time on the path doing things you are passionate about. And then as that depletes, finding the next thing you're passionate about and keep putting yourself towards that. And I was actually commissioned by uh, a theater uh, in Pennsylvania who asked me to create some artwork for a play they were doing about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Through our discussions we decided that shoes would be this amazing medium because we think about people in the marches and we think about all the people who have followed in his footsteps and so we collected hundreds of shoes from their community and we brought them all together and then I had basically a day and a half in a parking lot to arrange them. You know this is such a, a thought-provoking image that then helped them as a theater and of course helped me as an artist to, to grow as well. This series I was creating was I've been calling witness and this idea of sort of people looking directly out and sort of the faces that are should be seen and the faces that are watching sort of what's happening and being like this is this is the the real face of America this is the real face of like what we should be focusing on and, and, and paying attention to this photo is just crazy this will go on for a long time and what I'll do is I'll block in the colors and then I'll get refined into the details after that. Let's remember so these acts of courage and, this, and the roles that we can play as citizens in our country and so sort of have that be a focal thing. So it's interesting because when, when I do humans, I try not to make the color um, uh, like naturalistic. Like I'm, I'm working in this palette of colors that I'm trying to make uh, so that it makes everybody equal and there's not a sense of skin color. Every day, every day, there are strange things happening. She's called the, the godmother of rock and roll, Sister Rosetta Tharp. She actually ended up in the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, finally. Uh, and But the thing I didn't know until just recently, which I learned uh, from an article that was in Richmond Magazine, was that she uh, lived in this neighborhood where I'm now. And I was shocked because I had heard of her 
uh, through other people, but I, I had no idea that there was a Richmond connection. And sadly, there has never really been any recognition of her in the city. Specific, you know, specifically growing up in Richmond and being a Richmonder now, I want to make sure that the city is representative of the people who are in it and the people who are part of it and who should be, you know, the history that we should know about. So my advice is that you're not an aspiring artist, you're an artist. And I think that it's really important um, to think a lot about these labels that we have, um, especially when it comes to art, because I think there's this real pedestal that we put people on and, oh, that's over there and that's not me and one day and I can't. But that fear that holds us back is usually about doing things right, getting, getting it right. Do, you know, is this for me? Is this my path? Am I good at this? What? I have it too. I mean, I, it'll never go away, but I've learned to follow the process and trust it, which is that, you know, you make stuff and you put it in the world and that's it. You just keep doing that and things happen. Noah co-runs an art and innovation consulting firm with his sister, with whom he also co-wrote a book called Creative Sprint. He's written several other books too. For more on Noah, visit noahscalen.com. Have you ever heard of Feldenkrais? It's a therapy developed in the 1920s by a nuclear physicist after he hurt his knee and studied babies for inspiration on how to move. His awareness through movement lessons are now helping veterans suffering from chronic pain at Richmond's McGuire VA Medical Center. Today, we're going to do my favorite lesson. It's particularly good with hips and low back. So I'm gonna ask you to sit at the back of your chair and just rest. Well, I have um, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, um, depression, and um, this is the place that saved me, so I'm grateful. And then I want you to slowly move your left knee a little out and a little in. Only go as far as it's easy. What do you, know, what do you feel in your hip? Feldenkrais is a gentle movement to create awareness that people can use for improving their stability, their flexibility, reducing their pain, and just generally overall improving their lives. As you do these small movements, you begin to, to find yourself, to find what parts of you move and what parts are difficult, and then you begin to see options. Maybe I don't have to, for example, reach this way to get something, I could go this way and get there easier. I have a lesson I call my Advil lesson, and I get on the floor and I do the lesson and I stand up and I feel like I took two Advil. So the gentle movement has released tension and tightness and I can move again. And then try your right hand and see how the right side is. And it takes me away from thinking about pain. It hurts to walk. Um, every seems like every muscle, every joint, and sometimes just tissue, just barely touching the skin hurts. It's an area where there's not a whole lot of um, support out there, but when we come together here, for me, it's being back with my comrades again. I, f I feel that connection. I, I feel like I belong. Move as your shoulder moves. It's a good thing. Yeah, it lifts your spirits. So it lifts your, your body, your mind, and your spirits. Exactly, that's the whole saving grace of it all. And come down. Do that one more time. I'm um, able to walk out now and um, and feel lifted. Yeah. Pay attention to your left heel and your left leg. The good thing about these lessons is they're doing it themselves, so they can limit how much they move. If there's a time when there's a movement they can't do, they imagine it, and their nervous system fires, and they get all the benefit. People stand up and go, "Oh, I'm taller," or "Oh, my shoulder moves," or hey, I can walk easier, and that's a gift. I would think that that's a great part of pain management too, just that overall, that feeling, that, that happiness. Oh yeah, they come in now and they're all buddies and they start chatting and I'm like, hey, wait a minute, we have a class. <laughs> but that's good because that connection helps them to feel comfortable here. And as you lift your left shoulder, Roll it. Your weight gets heavier on the right side and lighter it's on the left. Good. Gratifying to be with other people who have been and in are experiencing pain like you. So I um, treasure those opportunities, and that's why it's like a safe place to come back here 
it's life-saving. So give yourself a pat on the back for taking care of yourself today. Good for you. Take care. You're welcome. Have a nice day. There are many Feldenkrais practitioners around the state if you're interested in a session. For more information on this therapy at McGuire, check out its webpage for the Veterans Integrated Pain Center. April and May are the months when Virginia takes part in Great Strides, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's largest fundraising event. So we thought it would be the perfect time to look at this genetic disease that makes it hard to breathe, what strides have been made in living with CF, and how the lifespan is now longer than it was just decades ago. Joining us now are Ella Balassa, who has cystic fibrosis, and Terry Quinnen, the executive director of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in Virginia. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Terry, what is cystic fibrosis in general terms, and, and really, how are people living with it? Yeah, so cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that is relentless, progressive, and life-shortening. And basically, it causes thick mucus to build up in your lungs. It makes it hard to breathe. It also affects every organ in your body. And Ella, what is it like on your best and your worst days living with cystic fibrosis? So there's an, an analogy that having CF is like breathing through a straw. And I have 22% lung function. So imagine 22 out of a 100%, which is what most people have. Um, so at this point, I use supplemental oxygen um, through a nasal cannula almost constantly. Um, so on good days, which is in the past couple weeks, I've been feeling well. Um, it's difficult for me to get out of my car, go up to my driveway, up to my house, get up a few couple of steps, um, take my shoes off and take my coat off, then I have to sit down on the couch to catch my breath. Um, so that's on a good day. On bad days when I have mucus flare-ups, um, a lot of congestion, then it's difficult even for me to shampoo my hair in the shower. Those days when you can't breathe, I mean, what is that like? How do you manage that? Um, just <laughs> taking it day by day, moment by moment, um, doing airway clearance therapies to try to open the airways and be able to breathe as much as I possibly can, using that supplemental oxygen when I need to, which is a lot. Are you able to live an active lifestyle? I try to, um, despite having these limitations. Um, I go out with friends for dinner. Um, I work part-time in a microbiology lab. I am the CF ambassador for the um, Brewers Ball for Richmond, uh, for the CF Foundation. Um, so I have to modify the way I do things. So I have to take the oxygen with me and um, I walk at a slower pace than my peers and friends. And if there's a hill or a staircase, then I'll get somebody to give me a piggyback ride. How has it changed, Terry CF, over the years as far as managing it, living with it? Uh, quite significantly. When yeah. the foundation was founded uh, 65 years ago by parents who were um, who had children with cystic fibrosis, it really started with them uh, recruiting doctors to really come in and try to treat and manage uh, the disease. So back when the foundation was founded then, uh, the life expectancy of someone born with cystic fibrosis was around uh, four years old. Most children did not uh, live long enough to attend elementary school. And now because of the work of the, the foundation, our median life expectancy is in the 40s which is fantastic and amazing, but it's still not uh, long enough. Is there any research out there too that there could be a big breakthrough coming up? Yes, uh, the foundation uh, is wonderful about uh, conducting very uh, cutting edge, innovative research. We have a, an excellent patient registry. We accredit and have 120 CF care centers across the country providing precision care for our patients and we also have uh, really uh, wonderful drugs on the, the market that work at the root cause of CF at the cellular level and we're doing RNA editing uh, research and also gene therapy and gene editing which is what we hope will find the ultimate cure for everyone with cystic fibrosis. So, so many great developments there and of course transplant too an option. I know Ella you're being evaluated right now for a lung transplant. What would doctors expect as far as lung capacity once that happens? 
Yeah, so the donor lungs that I will receive um, don't genetically have CF, so um, I will not have the physical limitations I do because it, those lungs will not have the damaged lung tissue that my current lungs do. Um, so I hope to be able to do a lot of physical activities, bike ride, um, hike, all the things that I can't do now. How do you keep such a positive attitude with, with symptoms daily? You know, I, not, I try not to dwell on, on things when it's difficult, um, just one day at a time kind of mentality. Um, there's this um, saying that this too shall pass and you know, nothing is permanent and we can get through the difficult times and hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel. Just keep going. We could all learn from your example. We wish you luck as you're evaluated for a lung transplant. Terry will keep an eye on a lot of that research. Thank you for adding to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. For more information about the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and how to participate in the Great Stride Walks near you, go to cff.org. Virginia Currents is on the move to explore a contra dance. It's a style of folk dance featuring live music that originates from the English, Scottish, and French countrysides. There's a variety of dances, festivals, and gatherings across Virginia. Bringing a partner is not required. Just show up and join in. People with different skill levels and backgrounds come together from all over, creating a sense of community. We visited one in Richmond to experience the foot stomping and toe tapping family friendly fun. I find that contra dancing is one of the few places that I interact with such a diverse group of people. Different ages, different parts of the state. Um, I, I feel like our lives, you know, you work with the same co-workers or the same people who live on your street and you don't get to see a wide variety of people very much, so. One of the great things is that uh, contra dancing, we have people who are, we have kids who are teens, we have seniors, we have people of all ages, all genders, all backgrounds from every part of the state and, and elsewhere uh, in the country and around the world. Everyone can have a good time dancing, you just have to give it a shot. Um, and, you know, we both sort of came into it by accident almost, you know. A friend brought us and then suddenly there it is and now we've been doing it for a long time and we just keep coming back because it's so great. It's a great kind of dancing for people who say they can't dance um, because there's someone up there telling you what to do. To stand back to back, facing your partner. The caller is the person who's giving the directions. Um, they're usually on a stage or up at the front of a hall with the musicians. You hear the live music, um, hopefully you can hear the beat to that. Unlike square dancing, which most people have seen, um, you have to take lessons to do that. Whereas for contra dancing, you can come in and um, have somebody say, this is your right hand, this is your left hand, give you a few little hints like that, and you're good to go. People are, are more familiar with square dance, probably, but if you think about the squares and the, the forms that you do in square dance, you do the same thing in contra, but you're in, in lines. But a lot of it is the actual uh, facial, face-to-face, -face, eye contact, so, and, and you're touching. You know, so much of life today, we don't touch. It's, it's fun to dance, the music is great, but the people are really wonderful and they'll always accept things. Whether it's your first time dancing or you've been dancing for years and years, you know, we're all gonna make mistakes, but after you make a mistake, you just sort of smile or laugh and oh well, and you get to where you need to go and then you just keep dancing. You just sort of are naturally happy people. And I mean, why wouldn't you be when you're dancing? It's not a competition. We're all just here to dance. Don't let a fear of not being able to dance stop you from coming. Come with an open mind and a smile and the willingness to try it and you'll be rewarded. Contra dances are held at the Lewis Ginter Recreation Center in Richmond on the second and fourth Saturday of each month. Newcomers are welcomed and encouraged to join in. For more information, visit the websites listed on your screen. This week's spotlight on Virginia music shines on the microwaves. This Richmond band has a funky sound that will have you dancing to a beat that's unique. The microwave started with just three members in 2014, but now has grown to 11 members strong. You might even recognize one of their singers, Kanika Cook, from a previous spotlight. 
Their music ranges from genres like hot jazz, Afro-Caribbean, Delta blues, and even Irish folk ballads. They perform regularly at local Richmond hotspots like the Camel and Cary Street Cafe. Thanks for watching Virginia Currents. Join us next time for more inspiring stories. I'm Amy Lacey. Swallow the bay, it must have been love.